Good morning. How is everybody? I'm Dale Doherty, uh, uh, founder of Make Magazine and, and Maker Fair, uh, visiting from uh, Northern California. Uh, and uh, talk a little bit about the joy of making. And some of, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I started Make in about Make Magazine 2005. The first Maker Fair was 2006. And uh, this year there'll be about 100 Maker Fairs around the world. Uh, the same weekend, there's one in Shenzhen, China, uh, which is like the manufacturing, one of the bigger manufacturing areas in uh, China. But uh, each one has its own flavor, but uh, walking around here and seeing the, the different makers and the people here, uh, they, I, I think they're very much connected in spirit. Uh, there's something very human about making. Uh, there's something that seems to bring it out in all of us. And, you know, what I saw in the magazine and, and wanted to kind of bring out in the fair was just how interesting makers are uh, and to provide an opportunity to talk to them, learn from them, and, and really to engage other people in making uh, was sort of the, the core uh, parts of it. Um, have you uh, all been, been around yesterday? Have you had a chance to see some of it? Are you here for the first today? Um, but there's a, there's a great, big wide spectrum of making. And I guess the piece I want to get across is this stuff existed before I started a magazine. Um, it has a long history. I like to think of it as a tradition. And, uh, but it had kind of receded. Um, it had sort of gone from being a mainstream kind of thing to being something on the margin. So uh, I, I use the Roman god uh, Janus to explain some of this about making. Um, Janus is the god of doorways and gates and, and new beginnings. Um, has this idea of looking both ways, both out and in and side to side. So as users of technology, we all, we've all become users of technology. Using has become easier. Um, and, and we all see ourselves pretty much as, as as users, but few of us see us ourselves as makers of technology. Now, at various points, such as the beginning of the computer revolution, uh, you couldn't be a computer user without also being a maker. Uh, you had to make your own computer and then use that. And we've seen similar parallels, say, around 3D printing in, in the maker movement today, that uh, the early 3D printers, you had to build them yourself, and you had to kind of learn how to operate them. Now they're, they're starting to be, uh, you could just be a 3D printer user and, and less a maker. But I want to sort of suggest that making doesn't go away just because using gets easier. That making is hard, but that very nature of being difficult and challenging makes it rewarding and satisfying to people. And you'll see it all around today. So at the heart, makers are enthusiasts. They love what they're doing. Uh, they, they do it for a lot of very personal reasons. Um, it, the, it, I think one of the things you'll kind of get a flavor of at Maker Fair is not everybody here is in it for a business reason. They're here because they have their own personal reason. And sometimes, Businesses evolve out of that, but that's not where they started. And I, I think getting together and sharing uh, what they do, realizing you're not alone, you're not the only person doing it, is, is a key piece of that. And I think making originates in play, in, in this sense that even as adults, that we like to uh, get into something, develop our uh, 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 sense of that. Um, and, and it does lead and connect to work, and it in many ways has the intensity of work, but sometimes without the, the pressures. One of the nice things about play is, or hobbies, is, say it in a more adult frame, is that you're in control. You get to make the decisions. You choose the color. You choose the parameters. It's decided by you or by a group you work with, uh, whereas a lot of times at work there's a, a bunch of other goals uh, driving decisions. Um, the nature of the play, I think, is, is highly experimental. You know, can I do it? Will this work? Uh, and trying it. Um, tinkering is at the nature, of, uh, is at the center of making. And uh, uh, again, I think this young fellow just, you know, the, the way that you're kind of fully absorbed by making, it's, it's uh, almost not a multitasking environment. It's very much singular. Um, also, creative risk taking. Um, 
making invites us uh, into a process in which we're, we're going to fail repeatedly, and it's that's okay. There's, there's tolerance for failure and an expectation that failure is normal and, and, and that frustration is normal. And if any of us, if you work with technology, you know those are key parts of, of that, of trying to figure something out. But it's very satisfying to overcome that frustration. And, uh, and I think uh, part of the, the learning opportunities around making are not just to do what you know how to do, but to do what you don't know how to do, to try something and learn something new. Uh, uh, so, um, and then there's the nature of it, it's just practical problem solving. You know, how does this work, can I fix it? And uh, trying again until you, you figure that out. I think one of the uh, biggest dimensions that this generation of making has added is, is to see making as a form of creative expression. That uh, this is a, an electric muffin, it's called. It's a motorized uh, uh, muffin tin, and uh, we'll, they will sp spread around here. And why do people do that? You know, it has no functional purpose. It's not going out on the road. It's, uh, but it's, it's actually, you can see the others in the background. Uh, they do it as a group. It's fun. People come up and talk to you, and uh, they want to ride in your muffin. So <laughs> here's a, a short video of, of uh, from Maker Fair Bay Area. And just to really just highlight it. At the heart of Maker Fair is this idea of play. We kind of get lost in it. People here have a love of what they're doing and it comes across and you walk away feeling optimistic. with is a feeling that they can do things. So if there's a, a goal I have in, in, in Maker Faire is this sort of DIY sense to realize you can do things, that there's a, a lot of stuff that's possible. Um, and technology in particular you know, increases our ability to do things, to, to be able to get a sense of control over the things that are in our lives, in our, in our community. Um, you know, it's sometimes a, 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 a soft message, but, you know, really that sense of empowerment. Uh, technology has given us an opportunity to feel like we can really do things. And uh, I don't want to live in a world where only a few people feel that. I want everybody to feel that. I want them to realize not, it's not just the smart kids that get to do things, but everybody. Because we weren't the smart kids either. So making, um, as I mentioned earlier, is, is comes really, I think, out of a tradition. Um, it's part of human culture and, and part of every culture. But uh, this is, in 1944, uh, Popular Mechanics, the early 20th century magazines, uh, Popular uh, Science and Popular Mechanics. They were kind of printed to make as in a trim size that sort of is an homage to, to those magazines. Um, I kind of... Uh, you know, pick up on here. This is building this, this safe sidewalk car for your kids. This is a, a scooter powered by a power drill and some kind of shopping cart. But, um, you know, make your own printed circuits is a, is a project on there. Um, we've had that article in the magazine. Uh, I didn't actually realize it, but we, it's, the technique hasn't, of etching circuits hasn't changed much in 40 years. Um, so, but the point of, I want to show here is the word popular. Um, these were popular magazines, and millions of people read them. Um, Make has, you know, about a, re, a paid circulation of about 100,000. So, while I'd like to see this spread, we're still a very small group of people that, that see this, but it used to be uh, much more mainstream. And I think the magazine that I published has put a sort of a new face, like a sort of 21st century version of popular mechanics and popular science. And, uh, but I think what I saw in those magazines was just that sense of fun 
and, and broad nature of making. It was, you know, that, that previous magazines of building a car, but also printed circuit boards. There weren't too many, or there weren't any magazines that would put those two things together. Just as at Maker Fair, you can have these very different activities side by side. And the other thing that I think was important about making is that we were reconnecting the physical world. Uh, what I had in mind when I first put the magazine together was that the, r the real applications, the real computing that was going to happen in the future wouldn't be on a computer at a desk. It would be out in the physical world. It would be connecting sensors and creating environmental applications, uh, controlling lights, um, doing all kinds of things, that sort of understanding how these physical and digital worlds intersect and connect. And it's represented in small ways today through something like Arduino, a microcontroller that controls, um, takes input from sensors and, and produces some kind of output. But, you know, this is a, 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 a university uh, student's uh, desk, uh, you know, with two computers, um, a, a 3D printer. This is something called Eggbot, which is a little CNC machine that paints eggs. And, uh, uh, a copy of Make Magazine, some hand tools and materials. And I think it gets at the sort of working across those boundaries of physical and digital today. That you might design on a computer, but who wants to just design on a computer when you can actually make something physical as well? And kids particularly seem to find 3D printing fascinating. Um, I think it's important that we realize that 3D printing is only a one of the technologies of making and even one of the t only technologies of digital fabrication that uh, we, want, we want to introduce kids to. Um, this last fall we uh, published a, a buyer's guide to 3D printing. There were so many uh, models of 3D printers out there that uh, we wanted to help people understand them. But I think at the core of making is this idea that it's a process, an iterative process, something that you can get better at, and that you can, um, just as you can invent products, you can invent processes. You can figure out new ways of doing things. It, like um, a number of things, uh, uh, making is organized really as projects. Pro the magazine is organized around projects. Maker Faire is organized around projects. But increasingly, the world of work that, that we live in is organized as projects. And in the simplest way, this is a, a, a how-to for a glow bike. Now, you know, this might be something you see online, and, and you might just see a picture of it. What I want you to see is a procedure for how to do it, a recipe, an instruction set. And you may be able to uh, build that glow bike using this instruction set. You may not build a glow bike, but even reading this, you begin to understand how to use electroluminescent wire in unusual ways, just simply how to, how to make the basic connections. And it breaks down the mystery of it, and it makes it accessible to more people. So um, this is a hovercraft. And again, made from everyday materials like a, a, a lawn a leaf blower and you know, wood and, and PVC. Um, but it's pretty amazing when that thing finally gets up off the ground and you scoot across um, and, and show people what you make. The other uh, dimension of making is, is it's, I, I see it or its origin in, amateur, um, in amateurs, in amateurism. Um, there is a pro side, but I, I think um, sometimes the world just looks at pros, you know? And it's almost if you imagine a pyramid um, and take something like musicians. You know, and we only pay attention to the rock stars at the top. But music is at the base of that pyramid is people playing music for all kinds of reasons, right? And they might just be at home in their, in their bedroom or they might be just playing music for family and friends. But it's all music. And making is that same kind of pyramid. Um, and, and I think it's really important, you know, think about sports. If you don't have a healthy amateur ecosystem in, in sports, you don't really have a pro uh, sports. So when we think about innovation and technology and science, um, we tend to focus too much, I think, on how do you grow the pro layer and not grow the broader base. You know, this is an example from the magazine of, of pros, uh, but um, DIY drones started as a community site around, you know, uh, both RC and um, autonomous uh, flight and um, led to um, uh, a company, 3D Robotics, and 
Chris Anderson, editor of Wired, um, just published a book called Makers last year. He went off to, to start it with this young man who's from uh, Tijuana, Mexico, Jordi Munoz. And, but, you know, it originates in, in how much the, like someone like Jordi learned about making from just flying planes. He was an expert in, in RC and other, other forms. Um, then they began applying computing to this and, and taking it to new levels. Um, another example, uh, making your own satellite. You know, who would have thought that this was a DIY project? But someone like NASA in the United States would spend millions and millions of dollars and have hundreds of people working on a satellite. These guys with off-the-shelf components build one for $8,000. They do it as a project for the magazine. They do it as something to bring to Maker Faire. Boom, they get money and raise money, and now they have a company, and people are taking seriously getting those satellites into space. Um, the last thing I just want to maybe hit on a bit is what really I think that the value of making and, and all of that we're doing here will, I, I think, has the power to transform how we, education, um, transform how we think about learning. That uh, making is experiential. Making is that engaging in the process. It's not telling you, um, it's not just giving you knowledge, but it's inviting you to do something. And I think this is a, a nice way of framing make, making in a learning context that, you know, it's deep immersion in a consequential activity. Consequential meaning it, it means something. You know, when you finish and you do something, it has some impact. It's also sort of personal and social development. Um, uh, you begin to build confidence in your own capabilities, a creative confidence that, one, it's worth doing and that you can do it. Um, and I think largely behind making, uh, if you focus not so much on what people are doing, but in a sense what they're creating in their, their head is a kind of mindset that they can do things that are sort of interdisciplinary, they're not overly specialized, they generally create projects that interact with people in the physical world, a sense of playfulness, this, this is fun. Um, and, and I think this idea really kind of borrowed from the open source world of sharing and participating in communities. And behind it, the world can be improved by what you do, that you can have impact and make change. So I'll close with this. Uh, young Joey Hudy uh, uh, on the left there brought his extreme marshmallow cannon last year to the White House Science Fair. And he was told by the Secret Service, under no conditions are you to shoot off that, that cannon. And it's just an air cannon. But the president walked by and said, hey, does that work? Joey said, of course it works. And the president said, well, let's try it. And so he used a bicycle pump to fill the, the chamber with air, and they shot the marshmallow across the, uh, roar, the room. And you can see the president's expression just as priceless as these are the kids with standard issue science fair posters. And, and, you know, how did that kid get to do that? That's really fun. So I think we're getting greater recognition for the value of making in school. And I think, you know, what I would like to add is I think many of the makers here probably realize the importance that uh, being able to do stuff, whether it was hacking computers or, or being able to play with rockets and, and uh, air cannons and such, you know, how that inspired them to, uh, uh, to do what they do today. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and see if you have any questions. And, uh, um, Ask, answer any questions. Anybody? Any thoughts? You guys are a quiet group. It's early on a Sunday morning, huh? <laughs> yes. Do you have any things that you would love to see someone make but don't make yet? No. <laughs> you know, the, the beauty of Maker Faire is that what you find out there, I couldn't imagine having there. Like, and, and even for the organizers here, um, who do exhibits and they dream of lots of things. The beauty of Maker Faire is you get better stuff than what you could imagine because it's already, you're, I'm not trying to ask someone to make something because I think it's worth making. They're choosing to make it because they believe it's worth making. And their insights and, and sort of the different directions that people are doing, go down to the DIY bio area, you know, who would dream of half of that? Um, and it would be really expensive to get people to make and do some of that stuff. So 
the serendipity, in a sense, of making, of what co comes to Maker Faire is, is the beauty of it. Um, and, uh, you know, just like the knitting robot that's up there, if you have a chance to see that, it's just amazing. And it probably took that person hundreds of hours to do that. You couldn't pay him to do that. You know, you, you, you couldn't necessarily run a program or a contest to find someone to do that. So Maker, Maker Faire, in some ways, is, is about finding what people are already doing and, and elevating and celebrating that, amplifying it. Another question? Yes, sir. What, in your opinion, is the most ambitious project you've yet seen? I don't, I don't know. Um, it's hard to, it's, the, it's really hard to compare these things and, and say it. You know, I, I will say, though, that in the future, we will see more ambitious projects. Even what we see today is, is just, a, I think, scratching the surface. One is because we are still early on, I think, is in, in a sense of, as a community, learning to collaborate. Um, DIY projects or do-it-yourself are still one or two people figuring things out. Well, what, if, what if we had access to each other and we could figure out, like you're working on some material, and there's a material scientist somewhere in the world who knows you know, the temperature at which that material just melts and under what conditions perfectly. You, know, you could borrow that knowledge and integrate it into your project. Um, so I think you know, this sort of leads to sort of commercial forms of making. But I, I think what we're seeing in many ways is a lot of what makers are doing today, like that satellite, in the past has required a fairly large company with a lot of resources, a lot of specialized talent and engineering to do it, and capital. And we're seeing today that teams of two and three people can do what those large companies can do. Um, so what would teams of 10 and 12 people begin to do? And that's where I think we'll get some ambition. I think one of, you know, an another scale of uh, that answer is, is that, I, I, is that I think you see things at larger scale at Maker Fair sometimes than, than you will otherwise. And, and uh, um, uh, you, you know, so I'm kind of always looking for things that are a little bit larger, that don't fit in your, in your den or, <laughs> or living room, but um, would fit like outside here. Um, but I, I think there's um, a ambition in terms of complexity. We're still going to see more of that. Any other thoughts, questions? Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, the, can you say the last part? There's a lot louder. How do you connect the people that have the technical skills with problems? Yeah. Well, I think we're all involved in real world stuff here. I, I wouldn't do that, that way. But here's the issue. What I would rather say is I'm more interested in taking those, what, if you say there's a line here and there, there's people that are technical, I want those people to cross over and what can we do to, to enable and empower them rather than to say that this group should be serving them, right? So I think the, the force of Maker Fair is to invite lots of people to participate and then there's lots they can do. And you'd rather people solve their own problems than ask someone else to solve it for them, no matter how smart they might be, whether, whether it might be government or corporation. We'd like um, people to be engaged in that. And, and I think really what the force of this is, whether it's small scale manufacturing and 3D printing, is that you, just as an example, you might be printing one of a thing that solves a problem for you. It might be a medical thing. You know, that, that you know, like, um, one of the areas that 3D printers are being used is prosthetics. And, you know, because of manufacturing techniques, a lot of things are small, medium, and large, right? With, with a 3D printer, it could be precisely the dimensions that you need it to be. 
and it could be measured and it could be fit and, 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 and made that way. So um, I think there's lots of those kind of niches and lots of, uh, that's what we've sort of learned if we met, see where software went through open source that it could occupy a small niche that was too small for a commercial company but a community formed around to be able to support it. We're gonna see that with hardware as well. And, and I think the only thing that limits us is our ideas and our ability to collaborate, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I think we gotta make way for the Raspberry Pi uh, group coming in here. Thank you very much for your time and I'll hang out on the side if you have any other questions. Thank you.